The Bible says, In the last days there shall be doctrines of devils. And the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 2, We are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. So it's important in the last days that we are to know uh, which doctrine Satan is using for the last days. And we are to be aware what he's going to prepare and use. Now, one of the doctrines that Satan is using to destroy Christian churches is through a person named Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince. Now, Joseph Prince, I don't know if you heard about him, but Joseph Prince, he's been teaching this blasted heresy. It's a really wicked heresy. But I can understand his kind of thinking too, okay? So here's the idea. He does not believe that a Christian has to confess his sins to receive forgiveness. So if a saved Christian today messed up in something wicked, all right, I don't know about you, but during altar call time, what do we do? Huh? During altar call time after preaching, we confess our sins so we can receive forgiveness from God. Amen? We repent of it so we can receive forgiveness from God, right? Joseph Prince does not believe in that. So you're just wasting your time coming down the altar. You're just wasting your time before you go to bed at night confessing your sin to God when you pray. You're wasting your time. You know why? Because his logic is this. His logic is, all right, now, a saved person, his sins are all forgiven by Jesus Christ on the cross, right? So this saved person's sin is already wiped away based on what? The blood of Jesus Christ. It cleansed it. So because we're based on this, that's why when a saved person sins, this does not exist. This should not exist. So why should a saved person waste his time, so to speak? Why confess? To receive forgiveness. Now, Joseph Prince. Okay, I know the arguments out there. He's going to say, "Oh no, I'm not against. Uh, I'm not against confession. I'm not against confession." All right. So then he says it this way. Okay, we don't confess to receive forgiveness of sins. We confess because we are forgiven of our sins. Well, that's a dumb statement. Okay. Then uh, if you're forgiven of your sins, why bother confessing them? <laughs> See, you confess so you can get forgiveness of sins. If you're already forgiven of your sins, why confess? It's like, let's say that, um, that I do Tom something wrong. Okay, I pushed him down the hallway. All right, I pushed him because I was rushing through the room. And then Tom got upset. I said, oh, I'm sorry, brother. Uh, and I meant it too. You know, I said, I'm sorry. And Tom said, oh, it's okay, brother. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. And then I say again, Tom, I'm really sorry. And Tom said, it's okay, pastor. And I said, Tom, I really mean it. I'm really sorry. And Tom said, you're forgiven, brother. You don't need to say that. You don't need to confess it again. But Tom, I'm, brother, I forgave you. Pastor, I forgave you. Why are you confessing? See, that's the thing. Why do we even confess to God if we're already forgiven then? So that's a dumb statement. Oh, I'm not against confession. I'm not against confession. We confess because we are forgiven. I'm only against people who confess to receive forgiveness. That's a dumb statement, all right? Okay, now, but he has a point here, okay? We, he has a point. Every heresy, understand this, every heresy has a point. Every heretic that I'm trying to expose out there, they're not incredibly stupid. There's some rationale to their thinking, okay? I'm not just ranting and raving here. So here's the thing. His thinking, which is makes perfect sense. Look, if you're a say person, your sins are already all, and I mean all of it, washed away by the blood of Jesus, right? So why bother confessing? Well, let me show you through some verses, okay? First of all, go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know why Joseph Prince does not understand this? Because he does not understand one of the important doctrines within dispensationalism. Within dispensationalism, or rightly dividing, when you rightly divide, you're going to rightly divide things and not connect them together. See, he connected all this together. Joseph Prince did not rightly divide it. What is this doctrine from rightly dividing? Spiritual circumcision. What is spiritual circumcision? Spiritual circumcision is what? A man has what? He has body and he has soul, right? 
These are not the same, right? We have body, soul, and spirit. Now let me ask you this question. When Jesus Christ died for, on the cross to save you from your sins, did He save your body or did He save your soul? Did He save your body or soul? Your soul, right? That's obvious. Did He save your body? No, we're still sinning in our body, alright? We're still sinning in our body. The idea that Jesus died on the cross so His blood washed away our sin, so the body is not really sinning. That doesn't make sense. The body is sinning. But here's the thing. The sins that He washed away are the soul. Now, this is where it makes sense, okay? This is why Joseph Prince, because he doesn't study much Bible, he's not a Bible-believing preacher, Bible-believing preacher, he doesn't know this stuff. Here's the thing. Who is the real you? Who is the real you, church? Is the real you the body or the soul? It's the soul, right? When you die, is the real you going to rot in the grave or go to heaven or hell? Heaven or hell. That's the soul. So this is the real you. So this is what we mean. When we're saying a saved person, see? Say person, the real you, right? You. His sins are all forgiven and washed. What are we talking about here? The soul, not the body. I'm sorry, if Jesus Christ did your body, if He did really clear off everything off your body, then our body should be sinless. But it's not sinless. You know who's sinless, church? Not your flesh. You are sinless, praise the Lord. That's who's sinless. You, not your flesh. That's why it makes sense when you read Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 7, the flesh is dead to us. It's not the real us. See that? But he doesn't understand this. Why? Because he doesn't understand the doctrine of spiritual circumcision. What is the doctrine of spiritual circumcision? The doctrine of spiritual circumcision, keep your hand at 2 Corinthians 5, go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Here's the doctrine of spiritual circumcision. Colossians 2, excuse me. Colossians 2. The doctrine of spiritual circumcision is that the Lord Jesus Christ, when He saved your soul, He what? He circumcised. It's a bodily cutting off. So what did He cut off bodily? Your whole body. So He cut off this from this. So here's the thing. Whenever the body sins, so whenever the body sins right here, Guess what? It's not accounted to us. We're still sinless. Why? It's divided here. See? Sin will always affect our flesh, our body, but not us. Because the Bible says He cut us off from our body. Look at Colossians chapter 2. We will look at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the what? Body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, I told you so. He, he circumcised you, cut you off from your body of your flesh of sins. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Alright, since you're cut off from the sins of your body, you're sinless. But, here's a problem here, alright? If Joseph Prince does not believe that a Christian must confess his sins to receive forgiveness, we certainly, we certainly do, but we're not talking about the soul here. See, see, he's not rightly dividing, so he doesn't understand. The forgiveness and confession here is not salvation, which is referring to the soul, okay? It's not referring to this. You know why we have to? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because this guy keeps sinning. And you think that when this guy keeps sin sinning, God's not going to judge you for what this body does? Oh, he certainly will. He judges the soul when it sins with damnation in hell. How does he judge the body? Not damnation in hell. That's the soul. The body will just burn up and pass away. What does he do with the body? chastisement, you reap what you sow, an early death, and 
the judgment seat of Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Oh, you think that God, you know, wiped the slate clean from the sins of your body so you don't have to confess them? Oh, look at right here. Verse 10. For we... So Paul is including himself, a saved Christian. All of us saved Christian. He is speaking to the Corinthian church. We, all of us, what? Must all... So every single Christian, without exception, appear before... Who? The judgment seat of Christ. Why? That everyone may receive the things done in his what? Body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or what? Bad. Look at that. See? The body, it commits bad. And what did the Bible say? God's going to judge you for every bad thing you've done. So you don't think that you, sh that you shouldn't confess? Oh my goodness, you should confess. If I were you, I'd start confessing right away, man. Right away. Now we're going to look at another passage. Let's look at the book of Numbers 15. Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15. Now Joseph Prince's logic is this. His logic is, well, you know, wh wh I can't live in my life in everyday peace, you know. Oh, well, why? Why can't you live your life in everyday peace? Well, it's because, you know, uh, I can't live my Christian life in everyday peace because I was taught that I had to confess every sin, you know. Otherwise, I'm not forgiven. So I never lived peace in my heart. So I had to think of every sin that I committed in my life. And I had to recall and write them down. And I forgot the sins I committed. And because of that, after I confessed my sins, I was worried if there were any leftover sins I didn't confess. And because of that, I had no peace in my my life in Jesus Christ. Look, God is not unreasonable, okay? So here's the thing. If I were you, I'd confess every sin, and you should. But what about cases, Pastor, where there are sins that my mind is ignorant of, that my mind does not remember? Don't worry about it. God even knew that in the Old Testament too. Look at Numbers 15. This is what they did with ignorance. Look at Numbers 15, verse 24. Numbers 15, verse 24. Then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offering, and his drink offering according to the manner, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation." of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance, and they shall bring their offering. So look at right here, in Numbers chapter 15, verses 24 through 25. What you're going to notice right here is that, well, what, a, uh, Pastor, I mean, I'm afraid, I don't remember every sin that I committed. No, look, just like the children of Israel, what do they do? For every sin they've done, they sacrifice a particular animal for that sin, right? But then what about the sins that they, the congregation is ignorant of? You'll notice that in Numbers 15, verse 24 through 25, or excuse me, the whole chapter of Numbers 15, God was mentioning all these sins that they have to offer animal sacrifices. But then he realized there might be a sin that they're ignorant of, that they might not know. Well, we got to be on the safe side, right? So what should I do to be on the safe side? God said, if there's something that you don't know about, then what do you do? You just confess it. That's it. For ignorance. So just confess what you're ignorant of. And what did the verse 25 said? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. So this is something important. When a Christian, when I sin against God, what I do is this. Okay, I think about all the sins I committed and I confess them. And if there's something that I'm not aware of, that I'm ignorant about, I, I'll tell God this. Lord, if there's any other sin that I'm ignorant about, then please forgive me of those sins. Wash them away with your blood. And uh, e even show them to me too. Show them to me. That way later on I can specify it to you. That's it. It's that simple. Okay? Look, do you think God is so unreasonable that he's, He can't wait to just send down lightning from heaven and kill you when you sinned in your body as a saved Christian who's trying to honestly live right, confess right, and repent right? No, He's not going to do that. All right? He, he's a God who looks at your heart. See, if your heart is right with God, you're going to confess everything you can to the best that you can. And if your heart is right with God, if there's something that you don't know about, then you'll just tell God, God, if there's something... Stuff that I don't know about, I'm sorry. See, and God says what? They're forgiven. 
They're forgiven. We're also going to look at James 5. James chapter 5. Oh, the church, the Christian church, don't need to confess sins to receive forgiveness. Oh, uh, look at right here. Look at James 5. James chapter 5, verse 14. James chapter 5, verse 14. I think not. Now, we're not going to look at all these passages, but these passages show that Christians, they can commit sin in their Christian walk. And because of that, they have to receive forgiveness. Look at James chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. Now, other passages that I'll be writing down is Galatians 5, 16, and 25. Romans 13, 13 through 14. Now, what I'm going to explain to you is this. Joseph Prince, what he doesn't believe in is that in 1 John chapter 1, this is the best passage we use to prove confession of sins for forgiveness. But Joseph Prince, he does not believe 1 John chapter 1, it applies to Christians confessing their sins to receive forgiveness. He thinks that 1 John chapter 1 is saying that because Christians are already forgiven of their sins, see, and because they already confessed and they're already forgiven, they do walk in the light of Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to insist. 1 John 1, well, we're going to have to turn over there. So despite of time, say we're just going to have to turn over there. So let me go through it real briefly so I can better explain. So let's go through this quickly. First of all, James chapter 5, and we will read verse 14 through 15. The Bible says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. So this is a church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he, so in the church, have committed sins, they shall be what? Forgiven. Look at that. What do you mean he's already forgiven? Let's also look at Galatians 5 and 1 John 1. Galatians 5 and 1 John 1. All right, so let me explain Joseph Prince's logic of 1 John chapter 1 here. We're going to look at Galatians 5 and 1 John 1. So this is where he get his idea to go around confession of sins for a Christian during fellowship and during Christian walk. Now notice right here in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now notice that John the Apostle says we, so saved Christians. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sins. Verse 6, Christians can what? Mess up in their fellowship and walk, right? Christians messing up in their fellowship and walk. When we do that, verse 7 says, we get the blood of Christ to cleanse it away. And verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Verse 9, we confess it. Okay, so let me explain again in 1 John chapter 1. What does verse 6, 7, and 9 show? So in verse 6, 7, and 9, this is talking about Christian walk and fellowship. All right. Are Christians walking and fellowshipping with Jesus Christ? Yes. What if you fail in your walk? What if you fail in your fellowship? Verse 7, you get the blood of Christ to wash it. And how do you get the blood of Christ to wash it? You confess it. So you can receive forgiveness. So you'll notice right here, 1 John 1, it's not talking about salvation here. It's talking about Christian walk, Christian fellowship. So because we mess up, you and I mess up in our walk and our fellowship with Jesus many times, what do we do? We confess it to God, right? So His blood can wash it away and give us forgiveness, right? So Joseph Prince knows that. So because of this, he tries to twist this by saying this. Walk and fellowship does, is not a separate thing from salvation. Both of these things mean salvation. <laughs> That's what he insists. So he's saying that because Christians are saved, they will walk in the light. 
and they got the blood to cleanse away their sins and they're already forgiven. See, that's his tactic. But we don't believe in that. We divide it. We say, no, this is talking about walk in fellowship, not salvation here. That's what we have to confess. But Prince says, no, these are the same thing right here. Walk, fellowship, salvation. So these things are non-applicable. It's inapp inapplicable to a Christian. They don't have to confess sins to receive forgiveness. But the problem is, go to Galatians 5, verse 16. The Bible says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Oops. Why did Paul tell saved Christians, You should walk if you're already saved? See that? So this walk and sa salvation is different. They're not the same. There are saved Christians who are already saved, but they're not walking. See that? But not only that, two more verses show it. Romans 13 also shows Paul saying that you should walk so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3 says this. 1 Corinthians 3 says these are saved babies, babes in Christ. These are saved Christians, yet they walk in carnality. So 1 John 1 is not talking about salvation. It's a separate thing. Walk is different from salvation right here.